EC, I have that book for you. All right, welcome uh, to the third day now of the GRC Social Science Department's Race and Ethnicity Conference. We have a whole week's worth of events that began on Monday and go through tomorrow evening. Uh, but this is my session. I, my name is Bob Hendershot. I teach world history and various other history classes here at the college. And it's very nice to have such a good turnout uh, this morning for, for my talk on colonial Mexico. Uh, especially with so many familiar faces in the audience, both from this semester. Uh, my world history class from 1045 is here, but then, and then, uh, you know, so many other uh, students from other classes and from semesters past. It's very nice to, to see you again as well. So, yes, uh, my talk this morning is about confronting mechanisms of control, race, gender, and religion in the context of colonial Mexico, uh, which is one of my favorite countries to study. It's uh, one of the, the, the most fascinating cultures and histories and one of the most uh, beautiful uh, civilizations created uh, in this crucible moment of the Atlantic world that began really with the arrival of, of Europeans and their cultural encounter with Native Americans. And then very soon, peoples of Africa were brought into this system. And the world that those three different uh, continental communities wrought uh, is our world. And, and uh, so studying it is fascinating on a multitude of different levels. And I do also teach a, a Latin American history course here at the college, and, and uh, several years ago I did one, and, and I see you know some faces. DeAndre uh, was in that class, and it's nice to have, see him again, uh, though he's moved on to Grand Valley and, and, and so on. But uh, yeah, and then the last couple of times I tried to do the Latin America course. Normally my courses fill. Uh, I'm not bragging. I'm just saying. And 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 uh, the last couple of times I tried to do the Latin America course, I could only recruit maybe three or four students who wanted to enroll in the history of Latin America. And so we had, it had to be cut uh, from the roster, which is a tragedy, uh, because Latin America is so important, but I guess it's not that interesting. Uh, so when I had the opportunity, to, 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 to many people anyway, uh, so when I was asked to, to do a session at this year's Race and Ethnicity Conference, uh, I thought, well, here's a great opportunity to, to do some added learning for myself and to prepare some research and to make a presentation on a topic in a country uh, in a cultural experience that is significant to me, but also to plug my Latin American history class. And I want you all to sign up. You know, <laughs> I'm going, I have 36 seats, so they'll go fast at this time because uh, I'm going to get the word out a bit more. So next fall, um, I'll do the Latin American history class again. And if you find anything you see here this morning remotely interesting, it just gets better from here, right? The further down the rabbit hole you go into Latin American studies, uh, the more fascinating it becomes, OK? Well, anyway, um, let's get to it. Um, in recent years, especially within the United States, there has been, at least in the last 10 to 15 years, a growing interest in Latin American history, Latin American studies. And those interests here in our country, you know, we, we become interested in Latin America because uh, it raises many issues that now increasingly preoccupy us here at home. And for example, as people in the United States start to think about multiracial census categories uh, and, and to explore new ways of thinking about race, they're often interested, Americans are often interested to learn that Latin Americans long ago began to think in terms of multiracial identities. It's not a new thing. It's, 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 it's hundreds of years old. Multiculturalism, multiracial identities, identity politics in the US find a very useful and comparative uh, perspective in Latin America. So today, both the humanities and the social sciences, they give prominence often to the study of culture uh, in history and in political science and, 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 and uh, in other disciplines, and more specifically, thinking this, in this conference and in this session, thinking about the way that we study and understand ideas like race and gender and class and, and, and nationalism and religion, ideas that exist in the mind. You know, race is not a scientific reality. The concept, at least, of, of different races within the human race, it's not biological science that can support that notion. That's a social construct. There is one human race. Right? There is humanity, right? homo sapiens sapien. Uh, but often in history, 
you find that there is this concept in people's minds of different races within the human race. And that often that idea shapes the way that people interact with each other, that shapes the way that they form their societies, it shapes the choices that they make. And so it is important that we as historians study the idea of different races within the human race. And it changes, like any social construct will change through the centuries and from culture to culture. You go back to the ancient Mediterranean, for example, in our world history class, you, you'll notice that, that they did not have an idea of different races within the human race, not as we understand it in more recent centuries. You know, race is an idea that exists in the mind. When the Mongols ruled China, they had an idea of race uh, in the 1200s and 1300s, but that idea was not based on skin color or anything like that. For the Mongols, racial categories in their legal system was determined by the color of the eye and by the shape of the eye. And that was race and Mongol law, and that determined what privileges one had or did not have. And so it's an idea that shifts from community to community, culture to culture, from generation to generation. And of course, within generations too. And in Latin America's context, race, the idea of different races within the human race is very important to understanding uh, that civilization, right? And just even looking at one country, largely today I'll look at Mexico, um, but a lot of what we're talking about has implications beyond uh, Mesoamerica, Central America, into the rest of Spanish America, Portuguese America, and often into North America too. So anyway, in terms of multiracial identities and, 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 and such complexities, the world has a lot to learn from the Latin American experience. And as a starting point you know, to this, I, I like to turn to architecture and into a, a special place in the broader urban zone of, of what is today Mexico City. And it's a, it's a public space in a neighborhood of Mexico City, and it's called the Plaza de las Tres Culturas, or the Plaza of the Three Cultures. And in this Plaza of the Three Cultures, you see kind of the story that I want to talk with you about this morning, arrayed in different periods of architecture. In this photograph, you can see in the foreground the ruins of, a, of an Aztec Mexica religious temple, a pyramid, a step pyramid. And obviously that's the first culture in the Plaza of the Three Cultures, Native American culture, right? the Aztec civilization. And then beyond the ruins of the pyramid, you can see a European, uh, in particular Spanish style, cathedral. And that's the second culture, right, in, in this crucible of the encounter, right, the arrival of another culture to this hemisphere and the creation of, of, a, of a new religious dominance. And you can see, for example, that the cathedral is exactly the same stone and the same color as the ruins of the pyramid. And that's not a coincidence, right, the conquerors. Right, the, the Spanish, the European civilization, they deconstructed the Aztec temple and used it as a quarry, essentially, and took its stone to erect their own religious temple. And so already the architecture begins to tell us a story uh, about the creation of, of modern Mexico, or at least colonial Mexico. And that's, that points to an, an issue that we call hegemony. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But hegemony is a form of deep power. It's much more... Hegemony is, is what every empire aspire, or aspires to create. It's much more, uh, it's a much deeper form of power than, for example, military force, which is comparatively transient and, and, and uh, not, as, not as powerful. Okay? Hegemony might seem like soft power at first, but it's not. Right? It's one of the deepest form of powers that there is, and it's often uh, very destructive and, and uh, very damaging to people at the bottom of that hegemonic system. Well, the third culture then, the third culture in the Plaza of the Three Cultures um, is seen all around it, and I need to zoom out a little bit here. And that's the third culture around the plaza, and you can see that it's modern-day Mexico City. And it's busy, it's bustling, right? there's millions of people, and they're busy, and, and you can see high rises and apartment blocks and so on. And that's the third culture okay, that comes in this story. It is neither just Native American, it is neither simply just European, but the third culture is both. It is a mix of both civilizations. In Mexico today, the identity is mestizo, right? meaning people of, of mixed you know, heritage, 
culturally, biologically, in every way. Um, most people in Mexico today would identify as mestizo. And it's a point of national pride. Okay? It's who they are as a nation. They're not just European in their heritage and history. They're not just indigenous. They are something new. They are something unique. They are Mexican. They are mestizo. They are both. Uh, and it's what's special about being a citizen of Mexico, about being Mexican. Okay? And that's the third culture that is created. Right? As the other two collide, eventually, a whole new civilization will emerge out of this. And so that's a fascinating process to study as a historian, because it tells us so much about how people would identify themselves. And that helps us to understand why they do the things that they do, why they, do, why the, why they make the choices that they make in their careers, why they uh, treat themselves as they do, why they treat others as they do. Okay? Identity is a key that unlocks so many complex issues. Okay? Another you know, even wider image from above, again, uh, you can see that you have some ruins right, uh, from the earliest two civilizations, but then all around it uh, is, is the modern world. And uh, our history is amongst us. Okay, our, our previous identities churn together to create new identities. Architecture represents that. So to begin our story, I want to go back in time to the early 1500s, when in what is today called Mexico, there was a different state, and it was called the Aztec, right, the Aztec Empire. And it was very, very powerful. And the culture, the language, religious views in this part of our world is very, very old, thousands of years old. The architecture, the engineering, the math, the science uh, were very impressive uh, in every conceivable sense. Um, but politically, the Aztec was, was not ancient. Right? The Aztec Empire as a political identity had only been created uh, between the 1200s and the 1300s, common era. And yeah, it was a very powerful state. Right? They get a, a, a massive urban center. It's an island city called Tenochtitlan. Uh, more or less, it's modern-day Mexico City. And if you stand in modern-day Mexico City, you can see some ruins of Tenochtitlan. But at this time, Tenochtitlan was a city built over water. Uh, and its streets were, it, you know, it, it was constructed of a variety of artificial islands called chinampas. Uh, and that eventually laying them out in a grid pattern created roads of water, right? And, you know, for a culture without horses and draft animals, it was a brilliant, you know, innovation. But uh, vast urban centers, one of the biggest cities in the world of its time, uh, far larger than Lisbon or Madrid, you know, were at the time in the early 1500s. And from this powerful urban center, the first class citizens of the Aztec, right, the owners of the Aztec, the, the political and cultural elite of the Aztec, who are called Mexica, it's their ethnic identity, conquered the surrounding territories. And they constructed an empire that they called the Aztec. And ruled it very efficiently. You know, they have many thousands of, of uh, dedicated veteran warriors and you know, many vast natural resources. It's a very wealthy empire. Uh, by any way you want to measure it, by population or by agricultural output or you know, by, by trade, absolutely. But then in the early 1500s, we're going to see the very rapid, comparatively rapid, within, within essentially a three-year period, the conquest of the Aztec by a foreign empire. Okay, the Aztec had been born in the 1200s, and it had expanded, as you see, throughout uh, central southern Mexico. And they had the momentum. They conquered their neighbors. Right? They built the tribute empire. Um, and they taxed their, you know, the, the Mexica overlords, they were, not, they were not road builders. They did not develop their empire. Uh, they taxed the people of the empire. They took from them. Right? They built a tribute state. But you see, this did not make the Mexica uh, very well beloved right, by the peoples of central Mexico. Uh, often the peoples of central Mexico would rebel should they have the opportunity, and the Mexica would keep them down with military force. Significantly, the Mexica never achieved that state of hegemony that the Spanish one day will. So the Mexica Empire, right, the Aztec territory, will be conquered. And its precipitous defeat at the hands of you know, seemingly just a few hundred uh, Spanish adventurers, right, uh, los conquistadores, right, the conquerors, undisciplined mercenaries, uh, not professional soldiers. Um, 
It's unparalleled in world history in many ways, right, how rapidly this empire was conquered. But several circumstances conspired to make it possible here in the early 1500s. And all of them are significant. Okay? When they first set foot in Mexico, the Spanish, they already knew a lot about America. After all, there's already been the full generation since Columbus, Cristobal Colon, had made landfall in Hispaniola, modern-day Haiti, Dominican Republic. So they'd already spent a generation sort of island hopping in the Caribbean Sea, you know, seizing many territories, uh, developing tried and true tactics for, for seizing Native American uh, lands and so on. But by the time they arrive in the Mexican territory, right, the, the mainland, terra firma, um, within a few years, they'd be able to conquer this very powerful, very wealthy Aztec. So how did this happen? And much, much heavy weather is made in, in history about how the, the Europeans brought horses and guns and, and sailing ships. But these are insufficient you know, explanations for the rapid conquest of a powerful empire. There are more important, more fundamental factors of causation that need to be taken into account for us to understand this history. They didn't bring very many horses. Firearms were in their infancy. They're not terribly effective. They're a shock and awe tactic, but it's not really going to explain the defeat of the mighty Aztec at the hand of a few hundred invaders. The real factors that lead to the conquest of the Aztec, one of them is disease, uh, which, which the Europeans brought with them um, to the new hemisphere, uh, typhus, typhoid. Above all, smallpox, which created a, a demographic catastrophe that was at least as great and often greater than the bubonic plague, the Black Death that had swept Europe 150 years earlier. Uh, in some places of the Central Valley of Mexico, there 90% of the population would be killed by smallpox. And so if you have a large, powerful empire, sure, uh, you can defend yourself. You have got a dedicated military comprised of veterans and, 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 and highly motivated soldiers. But when many of them are sick or dead or dying, they will not be able to defend their homeland as successfully as they otherwise would have been had they not had what missionaries would later describe as hemorrhagic dysentery. Okay? Um, that's a problem. Right? That's one factor that helps us to understand the rapid nature of the conquest of the Aztec state. But also more than that, okay? diplomacy was used. And when the Spanish arrive, when the conquistador Hernán Cortés arrives, I have his image available, um, he will take advantage, his small group, kind of, of at first you know, less than 200 Spanish people, uh, will take advantage of the political situation. As I said, in the Aztec, many people who had been conquered by the Mexica overlords resented that. And here is opportunity. Right, he will form strategic alliances with many Native American communities who resent Aztec overlords. And they will join with the Spanish, because the Spanish, you see, are the unknown quantity. Right, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, so to speak. And yeah, with thousands of Native American allies, Cortes will be able to challenge the power of Tenochtitlan, and within a few years, conquer the Aztec state. But that requires diplomacy. That requires detailed linguistic negotiation. That requires intimate cultural knowledge. And they've only just arrived. And so how did that happen? Right? How were they able to conduct such an effective diplomatic and strategic alliance campaign in such a short amount of time? And to understand how that was achieved, right, there's another historical person that must be factored into this equation, one that is all too often overlooked. And that person's name is Malinch. Actually, she has many different names in history. Um, Early in the expedition, Cortez had uh, come across a, a translator, an indigenous woman, a Native American woman named Malinche, uh, who became his companion and gives him this further advantage. She becomes translator. She becomes uh, a diplomatic advisor, cultural advisor. Uh, in, in every image of Cortez, you'll see from the next period, Malinche is right next to him. Uh, they become a duo uh, in this context. So she has many names, but she's known to history as Malinche. And their relationship, the relationship between Hernán Cortés and Malinche, or Donna Maria, it encapsulates much of what is in store for the people of Central America in the next several centuries. What do I mean by that? The conquest of the Aztec at the hands of the Spanish Empire, they begin to call this territory within a few years. They're calling it New Spain. 
okay, on the manner of, you know, later on, you know, New England and New France and what have you. But, uh, yeah, New Spain is something of a misnomer because it's not just a New Spain, but rather what you see in New Spain is, is two different societies being grafted together, being stitched together in a myriad different ways, okay? Mostly by Spanish men and indigenous women, right, in, in the first several hundred years. Spanish men you know, were, the, were most of the people who came from Spain to the New World. Very few Spanish women came. In the early years in the encounter between Europeans and Native Americans and afterward, uh, Spanish men in America outnumbered Spanish women in America by a factor of nine to one. So within a few years, indigenous women and Spanish men became the parents of a lot of mestizo children. And those children, um, will be people in between these two worlds. And they are the future uh, of this part of the world. Right? They're, they're, their heritage, their culture, their languages. Right? They'll go up run households that are of both civilizations in many cases. And that will change identity. But anyway, this is what I mean when I say that the relationship between uh, Malinche and Cortez encapsulates much of the Latin American experience. And what an interesting character uh, in history is Malinche. When Cortes first arrived, he left Cuba, which was the center of Spanish activity in, in, in the Caribbean Sea. And he arrived you know, on, on the coast of, of uh, what is today known as the Republic of Mexico, Los Estados Unidos de Mexico. And he travels along the coast, essentially learning you know, more and more about these rumors. They've heard of this fabulous golden mainland empire of the Aztec. And he's meeting you know, from, from he makes landfall at a place called Veracruz. Right? They call it Veracruz, meaning the true cross. Right? Uh, they have a crusading mentality that is of the late Middle Ages that they bring with them. It uh, never really goes away uh, because of the history of Spain. But anyway, he travels along the coast and he meets various you know, small villages, fishing communities. And the Europeans, of course, have a very otherworldly look at first in, in indigenous people's eyes because of their different appearance and their, their metal body armor and their big dogs and their horses and their vast sailing ships. And there are gifts exchanged and speeches made. It's a slow process. One of the villages gives Cortez a gift to make nice. And the gift includes a, uh, a gift of 20 slaves. And now, most of their names have been lost to history, but Malinche was one of those 20. And very soon she stands out to the Spanish, to Cortez in particular. Um, the chronicler of the Cortez mission in history, right? The primary, one of the main primary sources we have about this is, is a, one of the Europeans who arrived with Hernan Cortez. His name is Bernal Diaz. And, and Diaz writes a detailed account of this. And, and uh, he says that initially uh, her name was uh, uh, Malinale. And then later on, she got another name, uh, which was Tenipal. But the Spanish, they will baptize her right, as a Christian there in 1519. And then they give her the name uh, Marina. Okay? And when Bernal Diaz writes the history of this moment, he gives her an honorific title. He calls her Dona Marina which is a title of respect and appreciation. So that right there in the primary sources is a first clue about how uh, large a role she will play. But her life story is fascinating um, and a sad story. When she was very young, Malinche, uh, her father died. And her mother, within a few years, remarried, which made Malinche an inconvenient stepchild to this new father. And he wanted to privilege his son. And so the, the stepfather sold Malinche into slavery. Okay? And this is, you know, again, years before the arrival of the Europeans. And between then and, and, and when she's finally gifted to Hernan Cortez, she had been sold several other times. Now, Malinche is one of these you know, very brilliant people in history, and in particular has many gifts for, for diplomacy and complexity and nuance, uh, but also for languages. And so by the time that she's given to the Spanish in 1519, she speaks not only Maya, but also Nahuatl, the language of the Aztecs, and has an appreciation for multiple different dialects, right, and, and possibly some other Native American languages as well which makes her a great asset to the Spanish. And they appreciate that, because now that she's amongst Spanish speakers, she will pick up the Spanish language uh, within a few weeks and months. And so very soon, Cortez realizes 
right, that Malinch is, is, is special in this way. Uh, astoundingly quick-witted and, and self-possessed. Uh, she will be his key cultural advisor, as I said, not only a translator, but a cultural advisor. She'll teach him about the religion uh, of peoples in that area, which he will be able to use to his benefit. Uh, she teaches him about the political atmosphere of central Mexico, right, which he, again, will be able to take advantage of by forming alliances with the enemies of the Mexica state. Okay, and she, as a diplomat and translator, will often be the go-between and engineer these alliances. With the Spanish for the first time in her life, she's somewhere between 16 and 20 when she's given to Cortez. She's not old, but she's already had a difficult life. And for the first time, she's found an opportunity to engineer some measure of security for herself. Um, she becomes inseparable from Cortez. Uh, she's instrumental, for example, in the, ca in the capture of the Aztec emperor, Montezuma, or Montezuma, as he's known more colloquially in North America. Um, but anyway, yeah, somewhere between 16 and 20, becomes inseparable from Cortez, their relationship. Uh, she becomes, sometimes she's referred to in Bernal Diaz's account as, as his American wife, okay, Donna Monrina, right, as though she were a respected Spanish lady. Um, they will have a child together, Malinche and Cortez. Um, and I guess somewhat understandably, her life has been read and written about as though it were a romantic story. It's been also portrayed as a betrayal of Mexico. Her life was neither. Um, as for romance, following the fall of Tenochtitlan in 1521, Cortez sent for his European wife from Cuba. She came over, and then he sent Malinche away, married her off to one of his lieutenants. Um, so, so much for romance. As for betraying Mexico, that country did not yet exist, unless one is talking about the Aztec. And Malinche had no reason to love the Mexica overlords, you know, the, the culture that owned her as property. Um, Noatel was her, you know, probably her first or second language, but her own family uh, had sold her to slavery. She'd had a difficult life. Malinche was more betrayed than betrayer, you know, in truth. But anyway, yes, Cortez would eventually marry her off to one of his men, uh, one of his lieutenants, with whom she eventually had a second child. Uh, Cortez kept their child. Right? Cortez and Malinche, as I said, they had a child whom they named Martin. This is important to what's going to happen next in the next generation, see. Uh, and when he sent Malinche away, he kept Martin. He kept their child, but sent Martin's mother away. And then she died uh, just a few years later of smallpox herself, not yet 25 years old. Spanish men, in the wake of this, this one isolated case, I mean, uh, continued fathering unnumbered mestizo children, most of whom were illegitimate or inherited little or nothing from their, from their European fathers. Uh, but these children would come to be known soon in the era of New Spain as the people in between. Okay? They're not Europeans. They're not Native Americans. They're not um, Africans, right? But uh, they're in between. Okay? As I said, sometimes Malinche or Donna Marina uh, is, is thought of as a, the, the embodiment of betrayal, but that's less common today. And now when you travel around Mexico, you will see statues to La Malinche. And, and uh, she's represented often as the symbolic mother of mestizo culture. Okay, is the mother of one of the first mestizos in the history of Mexico. Uh, she's the symbolic mother of that civilization, of that next generation of life and identity and culture in this region. So you will see statues to her, and usually that's the context in which she's remembered increasingly today. But as for the people in between, while she was alive and in the generations to come, in the next 300 plus years, uh, mestizos, right? Mestizo children were second class people in the Spanish world. Okay. And a great way to get into what I mean by that, when I say mestizos were treated as second class, is what we call the story of the two Martins. Okay. And this is the story of Malinche's son, but then also, I need to back up a step. Um, Cortez and Malinche have a child, right, which they name Martin. And then you know, the war goes on, and eventually Spain is victorious. And at that point, Cortez 
uh, requested his European wife join him in New Spain. She is going to arrive from Cuba. Before she arrives, he sends away essentially his, his now uh, superfluous uh, relationship with Malinch. As I said, gives her away, uh, but keeps their son. And then the European wife does arrive, and Cortez and his European uh, wife have a, have a child as well, which they also name Martin. And this, I know it gets a little confusing, but now there's two Martins, and they are half brothers. Okay? Uh, they have the same father, but different moms, and, and, and uh, one of them is full blood European, and the other one is mestizo. But they grow up together in the same household. Um, but even from the time they were children, you could see the difference in how they were treated, right? Mestizo, the, the, the Martin who is Mestizo, Malinch's son, is going to eventually, you know, virtually he becomes a servant of his half-brother, Martin. Um, and they grow up together. As adults, very interesting, um, they, they decide that as the sons of Hernan Cortez, that it is their birthright, and when they were grown men, they decide that they should be the ones running New Spain, because they're Hernan Cortez's children that it should not be the king of Spain appointing a royal governor from Europe, but rather it should be them. And so they, they hatch a plot uh, to overthrow, this is very early in the history of Spanish colonialism, uh, they're going to overthrow Spanish control and rule New Mexico as the sons of Cortez. And, and this plot never gets off the ground. They're betrayed almost immediately. Uh, but of course, they're guilty, both of them, of multiple crimes. All right, they're, they're given a trial. It's the same trial, same judge, same charges, which includes both treason and heresy, because the Spanish king rules by divine right. Uh, to challenge that is to challenge the will of God. And so they're, and that's, you know, the, the state would prosecute heretics as well, because there's such, especially perhaps in Spain, a very close relationship between church and state. And so, yeah, they're, 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 they did the same plotting. They had the same trial. They're on the same charges. They're found guilty by the same court, more or less at the same time, of exactly the same charges. But when it comes to sentencing, Mestizo Martin is brutally executed, whereas his full-blood European brother Martin is spared. Same crime, same charges, same conviction, same court, different sentences. And this is the kind of legal system that Spain will create in the Americas. Right, where it is your racial identity that determines what privileges you have or do not have, okay, what access to justice you have or do not have. Okay, Mestizo Martin is executed. European Martin is, uh, he was born in the Americas, but you know, in terms of his, his uh, legal identity in Spanish law, he's considered full-blood European, so that makes him different. And he's allowed to, to live under house arrest. His life is spared. That's a very telling story of the type of civilization that's going to be constructed here. Okay. They will use race and the idea of different races within the human race as a weapon to divide the people. Okay. Spain is going to rule Mexico and so much of the rest of this hemisphere, as you can see here, their empire includes uh, New Granada, modern day you know, Venezuela and Colombia. And, uh, the Viceroyalty of Peru, right, modern-day Peru and part of Ecuador, and the Viceroyalty of La Plata, which is Argentina and, and, and Chile and, and so many other places. And their empire stretches from the Caribbean, right, all the way up into North America down to the tip of the southern cone. And they're going to rule this huge territory for more than 300 years. And most of that time, they're able to rule it without a whole lot of troops on the ground. How do they do that? How do they maintain control of such a vast population? They do it with that power called hegemony, okay? that very important factor. The Spanish crown and the Portuguese crown, for that matter, it had you know, limited resources for colonization. And neither maintained very large military presence, some, but not large military presence in their American colonies. Okay? And the colonists from Spain, were always a minority, they and their American-born descendants, you know, who were you know, full-blood European, uh, were always a small minority, even in the central areas of Spanish activity. So how did they maintain control, for so, so much control for so long? And to answer that question, um, again, I have, a, I have another, biography is a wonderful tool for historians, and there's a lot in a life story. And so I want to consider with you the life of 
Sor, or sister, Juana Inez de la Cruz. Okay. And she lived in the 17th century in Mexico. And eventually she became a nun, but she wasn't always a nun. And even as, as a young person, um, stood out in her community in interesting ways. For example, at the age of seven, Juana Inez de la Cruz, she made a shocking announcement that shocked her family. Seven years old, she decides that she will attend the University of Mexico, which had been opened you know, in, the, in the previous century, uh, 100 years before Harvard. Okay? But of course, its student population was exclusively male. And she very reasonably offered to dress as a boy so that she could go to the school. Uh, and, and of course, it was out of the question. Her family you know, uh, purged that inclination. Um, it was hopeless for her. A university education, according to the prevailing uh, gender-biased wisdom of the time, was over her head. Never mind that she had been reading fluently since the age of three, or that she had taught herself how to speak classical Latin for the fun of it. Uh, forget that she had stumped a jury of 40 university professors when she was 17, um, or that by the time she was in her late teens, she was famous throughout Mexico for her beautiful poetry. Okay. Despite all of that, like the other woman, women of her, of, her, of her class, she had two alternatives. She could get married and devote her energies to husband and children, or she could become a nun. Those were essentially the two doors open uh, to her, and she chose to become a nun, long story short. Uh, and so she's known to history as Sister Juana, right, or Sor Juana. Um, and as a sister, right, she lived a life cloistered, but was very active. She collected and read books and became a painter uh, and, and, and uh, built libraries and studied mathematics, composed and performed music, and also in, invented her own form of musical notation. Uh, which is inherently a mathematical you know, uh, prospect uh, and undertaking. She wrote plays. Uh, her poetry was published in Europe, Europe. Some of it even criticized the prevailing gender, you know, hypocritical ideas of her time. Um, you know, those who condemned women's you know, sexual morality, she wrote, why do you wish them to do right if you encourage them to do wrong in one poem? And also, she was very interested in how her civilization scorned prostitutes uh, and would convict them, but not those who paid for the services of prostitutes. And so she wrote in a, in a, in a, in a thinly veiled critique. She wondered aloud. She asked merely a question that was, in fact, a guarded critique. And she says, she, she wonders who sins more. Who sins more, she writes. She who sins for pay or he who pays for sin. Okay. She's questioning. She has big questions ab about you know, many things in her, in her society. In the kitchen at the convent, she did, is she did experimental science. You know, she used the equipment of the kitchen right, to conduct scientific experiments, having read Plato and Aristotle. Um, she, she commented in her journal that Aristotle would have written a lot more if he'd done any cooking. Okay. Um, well, anyway, eventually she gets herself into some hot water, right, when she publishes a brilliant reply to one of that century's most celebrated biblical scholars. And uh, it's a little too uh, perspicacious uh, as she critiques, right, this renowned scholar uh, and one of these fathers of the church. And then other fathers of the church become quite worried. And, and she's stepping out of her traditional roles. And so, of course, they take action against her. And she is told by the, the, the bishops and the archbishops to, in their words, act more like a woman. Okay? Her scientific interests, they said, had to go. All her other interests, too, the music, the library, right? uh, anything except for her religious devotion, they argued, was unnatural uh, in a woman. That was the prevailing wisdom of her age and in her social class. And she could not defy it alone. And ultimately, they broke her. She consented. She sold her library. She sold her instruments, everything. She devoted herself to atonement, as she wrote, for the sin of curiosity. Broken, she confessed to being the worst of women. Soon after, she died uh, while caring for her, her sisters, nursing uh, sick people during a plague. And it's a fascinating story, right? a fascinating life. 
Beautiful poetry. Some of it is in our library. Why am I telling you this? Right, what is the significance of this to my talk today? The fathers of the church who condemned her, um, they never used physical force against Sorwana. They didn't have to use physical force. They embodied a powerful form of authority. And she, they embodied religious authority, and she was a religious woman. Revolt or disobedience, it was not something that she could undertake. And similarly, the conquered indigenous people of Latin America, of Mexico, and the enslaved Africans that were soon brought in, they were forced to gradually accept the basic premises of colonial life and the principles of Iberian, meaning Spanish in this case, of Spanish authority. Otherwise, if they had not been forced to accept those basic premises, Spain and Portugal could not have ruled the vast expanses of America that they did for those three centuries. When people stop accepting those premises, there will be revolution. But that's hard. Hegemony means creating acceptance, conquering people's wills. That's part of the Spanish conquest of the Americas, not just, you know, conquering and occupying Tenochtitlan and other Aztec fortresses. That's just the beginning of conquest. Okay. The Iberian conquest, the Spanish conquest, is much deeper than that. Okay, and we explain Spain's ability to control places like Mexico as hegemony. Hegemony is a kind of domination that implies a measure of consent from those at the bottom. It contrasts with control through violent force. Hegemony is a steady preponderance rather than an iron rule. The real end game for the imperialist is to control the way people think. If you can do that, then you've won. Okay. This is what hegemony helps to create. And so hegemony, yes, it might seem like soft power right, uh, in this form of political power, but it's very resilient. And I want to note that it does devastating damage to people at the bottom when they accept the principle of their own racial inferiority, or in the old fashioned phrase, when colonialism forces them to, as they said, know their place, they come to participate in their own subjugation. Okay. And religion offers one of the clearest examples of cultural hegemony. When enslaved Africans and indigenous people accepted the, the, the religion of the colonizer, which often was difficult, but it was enforced in the early generation, often through force, I mean, through violence. And they get the kids while they're young, you know, and they raise them to be uh, Christians, right? The, to, to accept uh, the Europeans' true religion, is they, that's their word, obviously, right? To, to accept the true religion that the Europeans brought with them. Uh, when you can get indigenous people to accept that by the same token, they accept their own status as, if you like, newcomers to this one religion, newcomers to this truth. Um, Catholicism, after all, had been born and developed far away from Native America. The history of the true church was a European history. Its earthly capital was Rome. For hundreds of years, most of the priests and nuns and certainly all of the bishops and the ecclesiastical hierarchy they're all of European descent. Okay. And of course, they maintain a very close relationship with political authority, right? The Spanish crown, uh, for example, right? The monarchy rules by divine right. Okay. And they privilege the status of the church. And of course, in turn, the church tells the parishioners that the king rules by divine right. And you are internalized with that message to rebel against the king's laws, to sin against God. Okay. There's no separation of church and state at this time, obviously. Um, the royal government, for example, the Spanish crown actually decided in colonial uh, Mexico where the churches should be built. It was the, the, the crown's authorities who collected people's religious tax. They collected the tithe, the 10% that, that everyone was forced to pay, uh, especially on agricultural products. Okay. To sin against Catholic teachings in many, many cases was a civil criminal offense in colonial Mexico. All educational institutions were religious. Uh, and so if knowledge is power, and it is, uh, the church monopolized that power. 
the Inquisition, uh, sort of a religious police force made up of lawyers and priests, um, they kept a list of banned books that people were not allowed to read. The church even controlled time. You know, every, every measure of time, right? It controlled the rhythm of the day with church bells, right? Set the, the rhythm and signaling the hours of work and rest and prayer. Successive Sundays marked the days of the week, a uh, seven-day week, which was, of course, entirely new to indigenous people, the idea of a seven-day week. Um, the Catholic calendar of religious holidays and observances provided milestones throughout the year. Collective public ebb and flow of emotions comes with that, of course. You know, think about the the celebratory atmosphere of, of Epiphany and Carnival and, and uh, the more somber mood of Lent and Holy Week and Easter. I mean, the church presided over all of that cultural activity, every measure of time. The milestones of your individual life, from baptism to marriage to death, are all validated by church sacraments and registered in church records. Place names, too, of course, that the colonizers create. Right? Most towns have a patron saint. And so it's San Sebastiano de Rio de Janeiro and San Francisco de Quito and so on. I mean, the, the, the religion is a hegemonic force. It's everywhere. And that gives them much control over the way people think. Another hegemonic force, both omnipresent and largely inescapable uh, in colonial Mexico, was patriarchy. Patriarchy, of course, is the, the general principle that fathers rule. Uh, fathers rule heaven and earth. Fathers rule cities and families. This is patriarchy. The Spanish and the Portuguese and other Europeans as well are often much more rigidly patriarchal than many indigenous American civilizations and, and many African societies that they enslaved, for example. Um, so the hegemony of fathers in, in places like Mexico, that must be understood at least in part as a legacy of colonialism. Patriarchy structured all colonial institutions, including the exclusively male hierarchy of the Catholic Church. Okay, right up to the Holy Father in Rome. Iberian law, Spanish law is based on patriarchal principles. Husbands had legal control of their wives and their children. So in all of these ways, the power of the church and patriarchy and race are successful in helping Spain control their empire. It's through the mechanism of divine right monarchy and, and the, the, the pervasive nature and power of the church that they can control how people think. Okay. Another important dynamic that brings all of these things together is transculturation and the mixing of what people perceive to be the different races. Those things go together. Now, naturally, transculturation, that can occur without any mixing of genes and vice versa. Um, nevertheless, the urban working class and the free peasantries in the Mexican countryside uh, in colonial period of, of, of Spain's empire, they're, 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 they're multiracial, they're multi-hued. Right? There are many different complexions uh, throughout Spain's territory as the, hundred, as the centuries go by. Intermarriage amongst, for example, very poor whites and black people and indigenous people was very common, okay? as were other consensual partnerships, often not, uh, not um, consensual, or only superficially so, are the sexual encounters between you know, social unequals of different racial categories. For example, as when, uh, please forgive me for doing this, uh, gentlemen hired Protestants, or, or not, uh, prostitutes uh, from beneath their own social class, or when these, these, uh, these wealthier people forced themselves on enslaved women. Um, again, that creates in the future, right, and over time, um, a multitude of, of multiracial uh, people and identities. And the crown sets out quite early on to engineer control through this dynamic. And they do so effectively throughout colonial Latin American societies, but perhaps very thoroughly, or particularly thoroughly in Mexico. Um, they sort people. The monarchy and the church sorts people into fixed legal categories referred to as castes, more or less according to your racial identity. This started the moment you were born. Okay? The moment you're born, your name and your parents has entered into the church records, right? because baptism, it's called the baptismal register uh, for the caste system. It's recorded. Right? 
your precise racial category. It's a legal category. And they're arranged in a hierarchy. It's an unequal way to label races. Okay? People of low caste, people lower on the hierarchy, they have very few privileges. They are prevented. They are by law. They cannot get an education. They cannot become priests. They cannot wear silk. They cannot own weapons. They cannot do, they are prohibited from so many things. Okay, many occupations and, and, and uh, to be able to own land of such and such a size or, or farm animals of such a value, all that is prohibited. A person of wholly European descent it would be at the top of this, this racial hierarchy. And of course, for example, a person of, of uh, pure African descent would be another uh, element in this caste hierarchy. And that much is probably familiar from those of you who studied American history. But in colonial Mexico, the child of a European person and someone with, of, of Africa or descended from someone from Africa, their child would become a third category under the law, right? another caste called mulatto or mulata. Okay? And then there's a fourth category for if a European and an indigenous person have a child. right? That child is mestizo right? or mestiza, and that's a fourth category. Okay? And then what happens if a Native American person right, has a child with an African person? Right? Then that, the result of their union, their child, well, again, that'll be a fifth category. Okay? That's a fifth caste with, once again, a different set of legal responsibilities, right, duties, and inequalities. And then there's a sixth category as well right, for indigenous people by themselves. And so already we've got six. That emerges very early on. Right? Six racial castes that are recorded and that determines from the moment of your birth the direction what you can and cannot do in your life. Okay? And the crown treats the different castes, ladies and gentlemen, as though they're different subspecies of human being. And you're taught when you're born that all the other castes, no matter what caste you're in, that you have nothing in common with the people of the other caste. Okay? So you don't associate with them, or at least you're not supposed to. Right? Certainly you wouldn't you know, uh, keep their company regularly. Uh, that, at least that's what the crown wants. Right? It wants the people of this caste to see the people of the other caste as less or as greater, but certainly different. And that's how hegemony works, right? If you're in a caste in the middle, yeah, you can look up the caste hierarchy and you can see people who have more privileges and wealth than you above you, but at the same time, you can look down the hierarchy and see people of lower caste and think, well, at least I'm better off than them. I'm better than them. I get something. I get a dividend out of this hegemony. So I buy into it. I accept the principle right, of hegemony. I accept it because it gives me at least some dividend. But we're just getting warmed up, right? That's only six categories. Of course, members of these six categories continued to produce children with each other, despite laws against this, okay, from the Spanish crown. They continued to create new people in between, new people in between the existing legal categories in this mythology of different races. Okay. And of course, every time you know, someone of this category has a child with someone from this category that produces uh, another racial identity, which confounded the system. It puts added strain on the system. At least in theory, these categories are supposed to proliferate geometrically, of course. And ultimately, right, you've got more than 16 uh, different racial categories, legal racial identities created and enforced. Right? A lot of them with uh, weird animal names like Lobo and Coyote and, and, and uh, during the last century of colonial rule, it gets really confusing. Uh, but it still determines what official privileges right, you, are, you have and those you are denied. Okay. And these are illustrated for the population with a unique form of art uh, called the cast painting. Okay. And, and in my initial image here, you can see the 16 categories uh, towards the end of the 1700s. Uh, but we can blow up some of them. Some of them were created quite large. And these were created uh, with crown money, and they were displayed in government buildings. So when you, you, you would see them if you ever had, were called to court uh, or in churches or when you went to pay your tax or to the post office, right? There's a whole series of these cast paintings. There's always three principal characters in a cast painting, mother, father, and child. Okay? And the painting is usually named after the child because it's telling you what place you occupy. And of course, they're not all equal hanging on a wall, but there's a hierarchy of them, as you saw in the other image. Okay? And it tells you, right, 
if you have the parentage or the ethnic identity, the racial identity of that child, right, then that's where you are in the system. That's where you fall in the hierarchy. You're, you're higher than these people and lower than these people. Okay. And this one, for example, is, is a, a European uh, and, and, uh, and an African, right, they produce a mulatta. The title of the painting is mulatta, right, the, their child. But there are many of them, and of course, they'd all be arranged in a hierarchy. Here again, right, we have uh, the Espanol and then India, right, and, and they create the mestiza. Okay, and again, that'd be a separate racial hierarchy, and so on and so on. Ultimately, 16 distinct identities of race. Not white, black, and Indian, not white, black, Indian, and mestizo, but on and on and on. They continue to see that punctuates just how much it is an idea that exists in the mind. There's one human race, and if you want to, you can invent more racial categories as it suits your purpose right, to divide the people of your empire. Why does the crown use this? I said earlier that they use the idea of race as a weapon to manipulate people. If I'm the king of Spain, I do not want the people of my empire to join together. What happens if all the people of my colony, colonies are by design exploitative, okay? What happens if all the people I'm exploiting, like you know, the descendants of the first you know, European arrivals, who often are, you know, some of them are poor landowners, uh, and, and slaves and freed people and, and Native Americans and, and, and mestizos, what if they all decide that they're being exploited by colonial rule and they join together and they overthrow me? That would be bad. Okay, if I'm the king of Spain. I do not want that. And so I invent this mythology, mythology of race and I institutionalize it using all the means at my disposal, all educational institutions, all government offices, all church, all religious belief. And I tell the people of this caste they are a different you know, kind of human. They are better than the people of this caste and that you two have nothing in common. You're both being exploited by the same power. Right? But I don't want you to focus on that. I want you to think of each other through a racist lens and see each other as not having anything in common. And that way you will not unify. And that way it's easier for me to divide and conquer and manipulate and exploit the people of my empire. And it works. It works well. It works for hundreds of years. You give people dividends, yes? Multiple cast paintings all illustrating this. Okay. They're an interesting primary source for historians because, one, they show us this racial dynamic at work. And, and they, they show us right, the invention of new racial categories as the centuries of colonialism go on. They're also interesting in other ways because you can, you know, very, usually art shows us people of, of the high class, right? people who are wealthy. And we see their homes and we see their jewels and we see their clothing. Uh, but in caste paintings, it actually shows us uh, how people of other castes would also live. What is their cloth? What is their domestic setting? And so people have studied caste paintings through a from a variety of different perspectives, uh, and each of them interesting. Okay. Well, caste paintings are sent to Spain, and then researchers in Europe, right? They categorize these different groups almost, like I said, as though they're different subspecies of human being. And they use that to impose order. Also in these years, successful people of low caste, right? say you were born into one of the lower, poorer castes, you can resist the system, but you also have to, in order to resist it, to negotiate it, you have to accept it, at least a little bit. For example, sometimes people who were born into low racial caste, like freed people, uh, or, or uh, you know, a mestizo person, a mestizo, mestizo family who, who is, has success in uh, driving cattle. Right? They might be able to you know, turn ingenuity and hard work into financial success, and they're still low caste, but they want better for their children. Okay? But the Spanish crown is always perpetually hard up for money, especially by the 1700s. And they create a system where Prosperous people born into low caste can buy an official exemption. Okay? Um, you can become, if you have enough money, legally white. And they change your caste by law. Okay? Unless you're eligible to occupy positions of distinction and go to university for your children and whatever. It's called gracias al sacar. Literally, it's, 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 a, it's a document. And it means thank you for, for or thanks for gratitude for taking out, as in gratitude for taking out of like low caste or racial disgrace. Okay? And so, yeah, it's, it's amazing, right? Uh, this exemption, right? This gracias el sacar, gratitude for taking out. Uh, this is expensive, right? To move up one category usually costs twice what a slave would cost, a healthy, you know, valuable slave. Um, some people hated this. Of course, the, 
the, the, the people of European descent living in the Americas who are privileged by the racial caste system, they don't like that. They don't like that people from below can buy their way up. Um, they like their privileges guaranteed by their racial identity. They're born with that birthright as they see it, and they don't like things that can challenge that. But anyway, yeah, you can climb the ladder, right? Sale of Gracias El Sacar, right, exemplifies that Latin American tendency to see race not as a, as a final reality, but more as a negotiable spectrum, that a ladder, right, that, that, that families might ascend. Okay? Similarly, right, families can climb the ladder in other ways over the generations without legal exemptions. Okay? For example, when sons and daughters might be able to marry up. Okay? This would be the vernacular, um, which is to say that they marry up by finding partners lighter than themselves, right, in, in terms of the caste hierarchy and skin color. Uh, note, however, that in order to negotiate and, and, and maneuver through this, this racial hierarchy in this way, to marry for skin color it means that you also simultaneously, you buy into the logic of the caste system. You essentially have had to accept the premise of white superiority. Uh, and so in order to negotiate the system, you have to accept the system. Okay? It's hegemony in action. Okay? Race mixing becomes over the centuries pervasive, powerful, and most Latin Americans now agree, uh, a positive legacy of the encounter between Europe and Africa and Native America. Uh, praise of race mixing remains the most salient and, and distinct aspect of Latin American nationalism in many countries, places like Mexico. Okay? Anyway, whether valued or abhorred or merely tolerated, race mixing is a fact in, in, in colonial life in Mexico and elsewhere in Latin America. Okay. By 1800, near the end of the colonial period, uh, about one quarter of Mexico's population is mestizo. Okay. And they're the fastest growing group, okay. um, which is significant. But hundreds of years of racial categorization, right, using the mythology of race as a weapon to divide people, uh, it has powerful results. It's successful. It stops people from being able to create a unified rebellion. And there are many rebellions in the history of, of Spanish control of the Americas. Okay? The dominant story, I think, is one of you know, stability through those three centuries. But there's always exceptions that prove the general rule uh, of the effectiveness of the system. I'll give you one of my favorite examples. But for it, I must move out uh, of Mexico. So forgive me for a moment. We're going to go south. We go into the Andes. Uh, and we go into the, the region of what is now Peru. Okay. And we see one rebellion right, in the 1780s. And it's called the rebellion of Tupac Amaru II. Okay. And this is his image here. Okay. Now, his identity is mestizo. right? He is you know, uh, someone of both heritages. Uh, but he sees the Spanish crown as exploitative and cruel, which it is, especially for people on the bottom of the caste hierarchy. And he wants to rebel. He wants freedom. Right? The ideals of, of the American and French revolutions are, are, and, and the philosophes of Europe are, are, are starting to spread. And perhaps uh, the end of empire is at hand. It's an exciting time in the world. Right? It hasn't really reached full bloom yet, but it's beginning. And his rebellion is caught up in this special historical moment. And he argues that this should be right? Tupac Amaru II. Um, he believes that Spanish authority should be broken, and he believes that you know, it should be a, uh, the revolution needs to be a, a unity among indigenous peoples, of whom there are many in the Andes Mountain region, and mestizos, of whom there are many, and also American-born uh, whites. And if they band together, he says, we'll be able to overthrow Spanish power, and we'll get our independence, right? we'll change the world. And ultimately, centuries of racism and the caste system makes that too difficult. Okay? He's, it ultimately, he does get a rebellion off the ground, but it's primarily indigenous. It's, it's Native Americans who are rebelling against a very oppressive crown. And the rebellion is defeated in a few years. They make a good fight, and they're on the right side of history. But uh, ultimately, they're, they're defeated. And perhaps 100,000 people lose their lives in the, in, the, in, the, in the bitterness and the anger and the violence. Uh, this rebellion terrifies the bejesus out of the Peruvian elite. 
okay, out of, out of, the, out of the, the colonial officials, and there will be a crackdown. But the caste system had helped them. The mestizos never did join with the native peoples in this rebellion, and that allowed the, the rebellion to be defeated. Racism did its job. Okay. Tupac Amaru was eventually captured, and he was drawn and quartered. They gave him in the late 1700s a, the most medieval and wicked of European punishments, where they tore his body apart, and they sent the pieces of it throughout the land to show people what happens. Okay. In the next century, Spain falls into more and more economic difficulty. The colonies start to, to separate. They're going to be affected by the ideology created, you know, or at least given national voice in the American experiment. But then the French Revolution creates conditions whereby the Spanish colonies are even more distanced from their, their imperial overlords. And in the 1800s, the revolution will come once again, right? An independence movement will be bigger. But those who would seek to lead it must learn from the past, right? Independence is not going to be easy. Right? How do you get independence? Right? Latin America will become independent, right? most of it. Right? Spain's empire is going to collapse quite quickly by the, end of the, 18, or by the middle of the 1820s. A lot of people didn't see that collapse coming. A lot of people are going to improvise. But uh, yeah, Spain, in a very short period in the early 19th century, loses pretty much everything that they'd controlled for so many hundreds of years, except for uh, Cuba and, and Puerto Rico and so on. But they lose Mexico. They lose most of the mainland. They lose their vast reserves of gold and silver in the mines of Mexico and the Andes. So how does that happen? Right? How, of course, the, the leaders of, of the independence movements, they, will, they want to create a dozen or so of the world's first republics. How do you do that? They know what they're up against. Right? They know they're up against the, 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 the forces of history. And they know that they're up against intense racism. How do you get the people of Latin America, of colonial Mexico, to put down their racism, right? at least enough to the point where they can come together to form a viable challenge to Spain's empire? And there are two tools that they will use, right? leaders of the revolution. Okay? They will use liberalism. Okay? And in this context, I mean liberalism at the macro level. Please don't don't think of it in terms of modern 21st century American politics. Don't think small. All right, liberalism at this level, it means, think of the American and French revolutions. This means constitutions, popular sovereignty, rule of law, rather than the rule of kings. Conservatism at this level would be monarchy and a close relationship between church and state, and no freedom of the press. Okay? Liberalism at this moment here, at the turn of the, the 1700s to the 1800s, it means constitutions. Okay? And that is a tool that we can use. It's a new idea, right? Peoples of colonial Latin America have never had the opportunity to, to experiment with even local consular government. Okay? So it's brand new, but it comes to Latin America at this time, and people like it. And the idea of popular sovereignty and abolishing the caste system sounds wonderful. Okay? And that, as they spread that ideal and they talk about it, and coffee houses in the cities and, and, and uh, through community meetings across the countryside. Right. Sounds pretty good. Yeah. And the other idea that can help paper over racial prejudice right, is nationalism. And in Latin America's context, there are no nations yet. There are empire broken into different territories. But nativism is a step towards nationalism when nations don't yet exist. The, the idea of a common identity based on birth, right? The battle cry will become America for the Americans, right? Peoples born in the Americas, all being exploited by the same crown, must join together, right? We put aside racial prejudice and the idea of difference. We join together America for the Americanos, yes? And, and uh, then they can rise. And that, these are the winning strategies, right? These are how the leaders of the revolution will be able to create the unity they need to break Spanish control. Who's leading them? Okay. It's not a bottom-up revolution. We saw that with Tupac Amaru's rebellion in the 1780s. Spectacular fail. Okay. Um, defeated. This time, in the early 1800s, it's going to be a contest, at least at the start, between two groups, two identities, one Creole, the other peninsular. Creole is an interesting historical word. You know how sometimes words change their meaning throughout time? 
In this context, Creole, it comes from the, the Spanish and Portuguese verb criar, right? Meaning to raise, meaning people who are raised locally. Okay? In Spanish America, Creoles are full blood Europeans who were born in the Americas. Okay? And they're the descendants of the conquerors. Often they're landowners, right? And, and, and they're wealthy and privileged people in the caste system. Full blood Europeans were born in the Americas. However, the Spanish crown privileges one group even above these Creoles, and they are called Peninsulars. And they're called Peninsulars, and their identity is that they were born, they're also full-blood full European, but they were born in the Iberian Peninsula, modern-day Spain and Portugal. Okay? And so if you're a Peninsular, meaning you're born in Europe, right, you are the preferred agent of imperial control. Okay? All the best, most powerful jobs in Spanish America go to the Peninsulars, Bishops, archbishops, viceroys, judges, tax collectors, right? The, the most prestigious and lucrative jobs go to the peninsulars. And the Creoles, of course, resent this, very much so. So when the revolution begins, it's the Creoles who want to cut their relationship with Spain. They want to get rid of the Spanish imperial control, and they want to run the show themselves at home. Often, they lead these revolutions and they talk a real good game about liberalism and constitutions and popular sovereignty and equality under the law. But they, like in the young American experiment, like in the young United States, they don't just get rid of racism. It lingers on after the end of empire. Okay. As you know from studying American history, you know, the founding fathers of the United States, Thomas Jefferson wrote beautiful things about life, liberty, and, and, and happiness, and, and popular sovereignty, and at the same time owned slaves. I mean, those ideas can exist simultaneously. It seems bizarre to us now, but it was possible then. The Creoles in Latin America's case felt similarly. Some of them were devout, okay? Uh, Father Morelos, Father Hidalgo. Simon Bolivar, right? I mean, some of the real big revolutionaries, they were devout in their liberalism and their commitment to constitutions and the equality of everyone. But most Creoles are kind of tongue in cheek about it. They talk a good game about liberalism, but when it comes to it, they want to use the idea of liberalism to get the people of all the different racial castes to see each other as one and band together to overthrow Spain. But the Creoles still envision themselves as running the show. They want to get rid of the peninsulars. And this is how they do it. They use liberalism and nativism to manipulate the masses, right, to form one movement that has sufficient power to end colonial control. They get rid of the peninsulars. They're successful. The battle cry is America for the Americans. Right, but the old hierarchy, the old racism doesn't just go away. In the new republics that they build, they officially abolish the caste system and they remove caste law. However, older ideas of race and hierarchy stick around. The Creoles will still see themselves as racially superior to mestizos and mulatos and African people and African, you know, uh, Caribbean people and African, you know, American people and, and, and uh, indigenous people, certainly. So at best, these revolutions in the 1820s do succeed in creating a dozen or so of the world's first republics in the modern era. They are incomplete. They enter a, what you might call a post-colonial phase. Okay? They have become self-governing. They got rid of Spanish control. But they're still shaped by their colonial heritage. After Spanish power in the Americas is broken, throughout the continent, throughout Mexico, flags wave, crowds cheer, armies parade. But everywhere throughout the continent, independence means less than meets the eye. It seems as though this great victory has been won, but struggle continues. 300 years of imperialism and racism doesn't just go away. It affected people's minds. It took centuries, but it went deep. And the new legal systems are a start, but it doesn't just undo racism and imperialism and, 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 and uh, you know, that racist lens that people have been conditioned to see the world through. It'll take more radical revolutions and many more generations of struggle to change that. And that's why 
I wanted to talk about this today because racism was constructed. It's not natural, right? It emerged in the context that people around the Atlantic world still think of it today. It's only five or 600 years old at most, okay? It was constructed and it can be deconstructed, okay? The struggle to deconstruct ideas continues up until this moment, indeed, it's, that's why events like this one, this, this, this race, ethnicity, and identity conference are so important. They're, they're a small part, they're our part of, of, of centuries old struggle, right? To free our minds and hearts and, 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 and lives from the ideas of racial and gender inequity. From the mechanisms of control that have historically been used by the few to manipulate the many. We need to keep thinking about this in every generation. We need to keep challenging ourselves to investigate the how and why of identity. Where does it come from? How does it affect me? The more we can challenge these ideas and understand them in all the areas of our lives, and thus, the, you know, that is what will allow our generation and those who, to follow us can fulfill the promise of the people's democratic revolutions. And what the people fought and died for in the early 1800s, right, an equal world, their struggle's not over. And they, they, did, a, they did a lot, but they left the rest to us. And, and we have a responsibility to think about that. Thank you. We have a, a recording going, so if there's a question, I hope there will be questions, we'll pass the mic around. So do we have any questions for Dr. Hendershot? Um, I was wondering, um, I'm assuming that the, the Mexican uh, Social organization is patrilineal based on what you said about, uh, what's her name, the Juana Inez de la Cruz. Mm. Um, so based on that assumption, the, what you said, the marrying up yeah. um, between different castes, would that be dependent on gender? It can be. I mean, gender always matters in, in those types of you know, social and you know, economic negotiations, which is what marriage is. It's a social and economic negotiation in many cases. Um, yeah, and, and then it's a, it's a dowry culture, right? And so, you know, uh, daughters of wealthier families, right, uh, have larger dowries, which gives them more advantage, okay? And so that will affect that dynamic, certainly, you know? Um, but then again, the other one for that was the, the Gracias El Sacar, uh, which a wealthy family would be able to use independently uh, of, of, of the dowry system. So there are multiple different avenues that you could use to negotiate it. But again, as you negotiate the system, you also have to accept its basic premise of racial hierarchy. Right. And um, my other question, I think you might have answered it with the dowry. Um, the, either way, like the marrying into a higher class. Mm. Um, like a lesser caste marrying into a higher cl class, what would the motivation be for the social mobility of marrying, like marrying down, I suppose, like a higher sure. class marrying into a lesser well, class? And, and sometimes people of a lower caste say they, they can achieve success in other areas. For example, they can, uh, they can become prosperous artisans and you might you know, become famous for your, the beautiful stained glass that you can create. And, and, uh, there's a, there's a, in the history of Brazil, there's a great artist, one of the greatest artists in the history of Latin America, Ali Hedinho. And he's, uh, he's, his hands are crippled by leprosy, but he creates beautiful sculptures. And he actually you know, is, can, can sell. And people who are skilled can amass some wealth, regardless of their, their, their caste. But maybe they're a lower caste, but they've been successful, they've worked hard, they've you know, had ingenuity. And despite all the deck being stacked against them, sometimes they can produce wealth. And that way, you know, their children, like say their daughter with a dowry that is substantial, would be appealing perhaps even to someone of a higher uh, uh, social caste, racial caste. Good question. Hi, thank you for, for doing this for us. Um, is it fair to say the Roman Catholic Church still follows the philosophy of hegemony? And if so, in a world like this, we have to adapt to survive. How do you think something like that has survived this long? Mm. Excellent question. Yeah, uh, does the Roman Catholic Church still have hegemonic power? Yes. Not as it did when state and religion were the same thing. Uh, the revolutions that we had 
you know, in, in our country and in all the other republics that have been created since, separated out religion, not just Catholicism, but all, uh, so that that kind of thing can't happen anymore. Uh, so that no one you know, political body can claim religious righteousness as a justification to rule. Uh, now sovereignty sits with the people. It doesn't come through divine right. And so the world has changed around the Catholic Church, and they have over the centuries accepted that. Yeah, um, They're no longer the, 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 the political and economic and even military force that they were in the Middle Ages. Uh, so the world has changed around them. Right? Uh, for example, when it comes to hegemony in terms of patriarchy, the church still has enormous power, right? Our, 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 you know, the new pope, uh, as he was elected, it started to, to be revealed that he'd made uh, very traditional Catholic gendered statements about what women uh, are and are not and, and can and cannot do. So that has not yet changed maybe as much as, as uh, someone who believes in gender equality might like. When creating the, the race-based caste system, how much did religion play a role in getting people to accept the race hierarchy? I think quite a bit. Um, once you can get people into the, the Catholic faith in this case, and of course, and if, you're in, if you're in North America, right, there would be various brands of Protestantism that would play a similar role. Right? You wanted the slaves to convert to your, your version of, of religion so that you could control them. Uh, and and uh, you had to be a good slave to get your afterlife kind of thing. Okay. But yeah, in, in Mexico, the church played a large role. You wanted people to convert to the religion so that they looked to the Europeans in control of the church as a source of power and answers. And if you wanted to have an everlasting reward, you had to, in heaven, you had to accept the premise of, of uh, the church father's power and, and their moral authority in this world and the next. And they can tell you that to get your place in heaven, you must accept the king's law, because the king rules by divine right, and the king's laws are racist laws, right? He creates the racial caste system to keep order and create stability. And to, to challenge his laws is to uh, create sin, uh, which is to risk eternal damnation. You know, so they're, they're thoroughly intertwined. It becomes impossible to separate them. That said, there is a degree of acculturation going on here as well, and Catholicism Yes, it changes Central America, but also Catholicism is changed by Central American culture, which is so cool to study religion because it is always a cultural give and take. So for example, there's the wonderful you know, classic story of the Virgin of Guadalupe, right, where, where the Virgin Mary appears to the people of Mexico, uh, to, to indigenous people, right, and, and uh, when she appears to them, she appears in this miracle, uh, who, she looks like they do, meaning she has their skin complexion. Uh, she appeared in a place where traditionally Aztec deities had appeared. And she becomes their virgin, right? And now they have some ownership, right? It's not just European, but because of the Virgin of Guadalupe, it becomes their religion as well, right? But yeah, there, there's, for example, you see it in, 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 in Christian art in Mexico, too, for or, or throughout Spanish America, right? There, in Peru, there's a proliferation of rainbows in churches. And rainbows is far older than Christianity's presence in South America. Uh, it's a religious symbol going far back into pre-Columbian times. And of course, that gets built in. Um, crucifixes in Mexico, have a, have a, they exaggerate and draw your eye intentionally to the suffering of the Christ. And often there's a profusion of blood on, on Catholic crucifixes in Mexico that you wouldn't find in other places. And the symbolism of blood in that civilization is very old as well. Uh, so they do find ways um, to make it their own. Um, so it's going in both ways. It is. Uh, but as far as control of, of race and racism and European authority, yeah, the church brings that. Good. These are great questions. You got another one? Um, yep. Who's... Whose idea actually was it to create the 16-part caste system just because that was such a perfect way of keeping the general population and minorities divided? Well, it develops over several generations, but it begins to develop right away. I mean, you can even see its rules at work. Like, that's why I wanted to include the story of the two Martins, because even by the second generation in the history of Mexico, it already matters. It makes a big difference. Um, and it's really as soon as the war is over, they're creating that that system where the conquered people are at the bottom, and the conquered people are Native Americans, and then mestizos, right, uh, and, and the whites are at the top. And that's a sad legacy. And, and, and one of my favorite historians on these topics, his name is John Charles Chastine, and he writes that the conquest and colonization is the original sin in the history of Mexico, 
you know how in Christian ideology the original sin was was eating the, the 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 forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden, and then every generation inherited that sin. Well, in the history of Spanish America and Mexico, right, the conquest and colonization is the original sin, and every generation since that time has inherited uh, the the racism of that moment. And throughout the continent today, there are many exceptions to it to this, but throughout the continent, throughout Mexico. Uh, Lighter skinned people, the descendants of the conquerors, tend to have more privilege, more wealth, more power, and the descendants of the conquered, those people who have, uh, have you know, are mestizo and people who are indigenous, they continue, they're, they're the descendants of the conquered, not the conquerors, and they have less privilege and, and harder lives uh, and less wealth. And so the original sin of conquest and colonization is still with us here in the modern world. It has not, we've, done, we've gone a long way to undoing it, but we're not there yet. What would have happened to Sor Juana if she hadn't consented? Do you think there was an element of actual fear of punishment? It was possible. Yeah, there is an inquisition movement throughout Latin America at that time. There are many different ways for women to resist um, patriarchy, whether it's in the church or without. For example, uh, the inquisition persecuted many people who uh, they said used magic. Uh, meaning that they used prayer, right, or, or tried to, to tried to approach God outside uh, the rules of the church, and they could be persecuted, right? They could be punished. They could be incarcerated. Sometimes there's even famous cases of execution. So it was possible, but the beauty of hegemony is it's often not necessary. In Sor Juana's case, she was a religious person, and and that meant that she, through her faith, had to accept the authority of the church fathers. So they didn't need to use force against her. I don't know that it was ever threatened. Uh, but when push came to shove, and so to speak, she tried to, to, to debate as she was so talented at, but they would not hear her debate, and she was left with no choice uh, at that point and for her. Other women in Spanish America, other women in Mexico, they would attempt to confront patriarchy by, for example, demanding that their, their fathers or their husbands live up to their gendered responsibilities, to be good providers, right? to be uh, 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 wise leaders of the family. And, and they would demand that, and they could publicly shame them if they failed to live up to their responsibilities as fathers or brothers or, 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 or husbands. But again, if that's your negotiation, you've sort of bought into the concept of patriarchy, and you're trying to manipulate it by also accepting the basic premise of it. Yes? What means did they use to bring people into Christianity and uh, essentially get them to accept the caste system at all? Oh boy, this is a sad and ugly story in the 1500s. Um, remember when I started out, I showed the, the image of the, the Plaza of the Three Cultures, and they had destroyed the indigenous people's religious structure. So part of that was to assault the, in, in, in the existing religion. And they burned books, right? They burned you know, people's holy texts, and they destroyed their temples, and they persecuted their religious leaders. Uh, so that was the first thing, is to create a vacuum. It was never entirely successful, I should say, uh, and, and indigenous beliefs, you know, have, have survived uh, and influenced Christianity in that region, of course. But the first thing to do was to assault the existing religion, and always for that first generation, people you know, like if, you know, the colonizers come in and they they purge your religion, you're probably you know going to be kind of skeptical about accepting theirs, but they're going to get their your kids see. They're going to baptize them and they're going to raise them in the church, and over the next couple of generations, uh, they can engineer. Uh, the transition, you know, by, by removing the options, you know, it's simply what is, uh, and, and uh, there is resistance, there is acculturation, but within a couple of generations they'll have achieved a level of dominance that gave them more or less three centuries of stability and wealth, makes Spain a superpower for 300 years, uh, all the, the gold and in particular silver. In the Andes Mountains, Spain finds the, about the closest thing to an actual mountain of silver that geology will allow at Potosi. And uh, they take the silver from, from the Andes to China, and then they, they, they ride that wave. And the, 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 the nexus of wealth in the world goes from Madrid to Havana to Mexico City to Manila Bay in the Philippines to Canton in southern China. And a lot of that silver from the Americas ends up in China as well. And so they're highly motivated to maintain control uh, of the source of this wealth. And race is a wonderful way for them to do it, sadly. Any other questions? 
Um, for the tale of the two Martins, they were both um, the sons of the same man. Why wasn't there such a big public outcry that one was put to death and the other one was spared? Was it because the people at that point had already decided that, well, he's not like the other one, so it's, it's his turn? There was already that growing idea, right, that, that uh, you know, race mattered in terms of you know, justice and, and, and your access to the law and so on. Um, the other thing that had happened by their generation was that the Spanish crown had started to create legitimacy for itself uh, through the church and so on. And, and that by the time you get to that point in their lives, the king rules by divine right. And that's become an increasingly prevalent idea. Anything that challenges that is both sinful and treasonous. And that's who the Martins were. Like I said, their, their, their rebellion was poorly planned. Uh, and they trusted the wrong people who were betrayed right away. So they never had time really to build up a huge legion of supporters who would mourn them. Um, so yeah, tactically it's a fail. Uh, and, but it, the, the, how, the, how the state treated them, how the justice seat had treated them, it does reveal a lot about this early on emergent racism that, that defines how that empire functioned. Maybe one more. Was there any relationship to those Martins, to Jose de San Martin from? Oh, um, no, I don't think so. Um, their first name was Martin, their family name was Cortez, and, and Jose de San Martin, right, uh, in the 1800s was a great, you know, uh, he was one of the, the, the Creoles who, who brought the revolution against Spanish authority, but he was from Argentina uh, and, and the, the very southern cone of South America. So distance and time separates them. Uh, though the name does sound phonetically similar, at least to some extent, yeah. Any last questions? Okay, thank you. If you wouldn't mind giving uh, Dr. Hendershot a round of applause.